and welcome to Ask the Expert. I'm Sandy Chin from GBH's membership department, and today we'll be learning all about GBH's frontline and its investigative journalism led by editor-in-chief and executive producer, Rainy Arison Rath. Thanks to everyone joining us today, including our Champion Circle and Beacon Circle members. We appreciate your continued support. And before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes. To turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up, and we recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will then open where you can read each what each speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. And thank you to all of you who pre-submitted questions. We will try to get to them all during the course of the hour. And without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our host for today's event. Susan Goldberg is GBH's president and CEO she is a nationally recognized journalist and leader who has transformed media organizations, taking brands from reference to relevance by diversifying staff, expanding coverage, and executing multi-platform transformation. She came to GBH after a 42-year career in journalism and included, that included leading local newspapers, the Cleveland Plain Dealer and the San Jose Mercury News, and among others and eight years as the editor-in-chief of National Geographic, where she led all journalism across platforms, including digital journalism, magazines, podcasts, maps, newsletters, and social media. And under her leadership, National Geographic has been honored with 11 National Magazine Awards and, and as a three-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Please join me in welcoming Susan Goldberg. Thank you, Sandy, and hello, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you for my very first Ask the Expert event. Throughout my journalism career, I've greatly admired Frontline's relentless pursuit of the truth. And in these challenging times, there is a need for fair, independent journalism more than ever, and they are the gold standard for investigative reporting. I'm especially proud to be here at GBH, where Frontline is produced. So let's get right to it with a little bit of a formal introduction first. Rainey Aronson Rath is Frontline's editor in chief and executive producer. She's guided Frontline's coverage through some of the most consequential events in recent history. She oversees Frontline's acclaimed investigative reporting on air and online and directs the series Editorial Vision, executive producing more than 20 in depth documentaries each year on critical issues facing the country and the world. Now, Frontline has won every major journalism award under Rainey's leadership, including Peabody's, Emmys, and in 2019, the first Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Gold Baton to be awarded in a decade. Earlier this week, they won two Overseas Press Club awards for coverage in the Ukraine and Afghanistan. So I'm so excited to be talking with you today, Rainey, as Frontline celebrates its 40th anniversary year. That means four decades, six U.S. presidents, and about 800 documentaries. The need for Frontline's fair and independent journalism couldn't be more pressing. So let's get started. Want to start sort of on the personal side. You've been at Frontline since 2007. Tell us a little bit about your journey to Frontline and what you've learned from those experiences along the way. Well, first of all, thank you for moderating this. I was asked, who did I want to ask me questions at GBH? And you were the person I most wanted to <laughs> talk to. And I'm thrilled you said yes. So here we are talking together. Um, and thank you also for your leadership. I am really thrilled that you've joined PBS and obviously GBH and Frontlines. i um, really looking to you for a lot of leadership going into the future. So thank you. And um, so you asked me the question about 2007. You know, what's interesting about my history with Frontline is I actually started out as a filmmaker for Frontline. I spent a decade making documentaries myself for Frontline. And so I was very familiar when I took a leadership role in the making of a Frontline documentary, which is a lot of my job actually is, and you know this better than anyone, that being an editor, it's really important in most cases that you have written or been a journalist yourself. And so 
that's what I really did is I made films for Frontline. And my my special beat, if I had one, was really looking at the culture wars. So I was very interested in making sure that we amplified all voices across America, across the partisan divide. So I looked at issues related to abortion from multiple perspectives. I looked at the rise of the evangelical vote in a film called The Jesus Factor. And that's how I really learned about Frontline was through making them. So when you look back on, on you know, your career, do you ever think, what would I tell my younger self, right? Did, what would be your advice to, you're still young, but really young, Rainey? Well, I think one of the things that I did really early on that I'm actually really amazed that I did this is I kept deciding to do the job that felt like the right fit for me and my purpose. I really asked myself some very deep questions in my 20s and early 30s about the meaning of my work. And I'll give you an example. When I was working at the networks at ABC News, I was in the hours department. I had to fight to be in the documentary department. I worked for people like Peter Jennings. It was really a terrific experience. But as we became more and more commercial, I started to ask myself questions about like, what it, how did I want to spend my life as a journalist? And that's how I noticed and really started to really look at Frontline as an option. And I was the one who knocked on the door of Frontline. And so I was really intentional about where would I work? How is my journalism going to be expressed? What were the decisions? And I think this is critical. What were the decisions at the top editorial level going to be about my journalism? And I started to have, I wouldn't say they were vocal disagreements with the people at ABC News, but I started to see that we were becoming less thoughtful, less nuanced, and I really wanted to be in a place. So I guess to my younger self, I would say like, that's a great thing that I knew that I wanted to be practicing meaningful and thoughtful journalism. And then to my younger self, I might also say, you know, one of the more important things that, um, that I did then is just work like all the time, you know? And so to this moment, you know, that's something that I think a lot about is the work-life balance. And that's something I've never in full disclosure figured out. Now you're my boss, so we can talk about this. But that's one thing is that I just worked all the time. And so, you know, it's worked out pretty well, but that's the one, the one thing that I think that a lot of people right now are questioning. No, a lot of people do question it. I've sort of given up on the work-life balance a long time ago. But did you ever want to do something else other than be a journalist? So interestingly, I was a debater in high school. And um, one of the more interesting things is I love public speaking. And it's something that I, I really enjoy doing. So there was a moment in high school where I thought, and I studied a lot of languages. I was also a person who loved to live um, overseas. So I thought maybe I would be a diplomat. But then... Somebody said to me, you know, when you're a diplomat for the United States, you have to actually talk about their policies and believe in them and, and sell pol the, the United States policies. And I was always one to question and to investigate. So I thought, well, that wouldn't be a good fit to my skill set. So journalism was a, a natural place for me to be to express those questions and hold essentially um, powerful people, governments and corporations to account. That's really where I landed and haven't looked back. Well, and you're still getting to do work all over the world, which is yes, fantastic. And we'll talk right. more about that. So here is a question from Grace in Cambridge, who's asking, how have female journalists influenced the profession over the last decades? Well, I would love for you to answer that too, because that goes beyond um, frontline. So please, would you add into that? Because, you know, your trajectory really led to a lot of our trajectories as women. Um, I think for me as a, a younger woman in the industry, especially in investigative journalism, I rarely actually until the mo this moment have not had a female boss. So in investigative journalism, I had female bosses at um, ABC News, of course, but in the, the specific part of the world that I operate in, which is investigative journalism, it's rare. So one of the, my biggest priorities has been to create pathways for women and BIPOC filmmakers, people, women on camera, as you can see on Frontline, you know, there are a lot of women correspondents now and filmmakers. That was very important. If you look at my leadership team, it's actually primarily women. That was not intentional, actually. Those are just the best people for the jobs. But it has worked out that more and more women in journalism has become um, less of an oddity and more of something that you would you would see. And Susan, what do you think? 
Well, you know, I think having everybody get a seat at the table is incredibly important if you're going to tell accurate stories that really reflect all of the communities we cover. And so having that, having a lot of women chiming in about what's a story and what isn't a story, that can look a lot different from what a man might think is a story or not a story. And the same, of course, extends to, to people of color. So I do think that the influence of women's voices and women's perspectives, I mean, we are half the population, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't be more important and has really broadened the kinds of stories that we can do. So, all right, Rainey, but while we're on the subject of women, and then we're going to move a little more into, into the journalism part, but do you think women get a fair shake in journalism now? So I would say my generation, I think we have done better. I think there is, I see things progressing. I mean, I'm the boss of Frontline, which is a big statement for investigative journalism. Really, there hasn't been another woman who ran Frontline or any other big investigative journalism outfits, actually, until the last five to seven years. I have seen a great, a great shift and change. So I'm very optimistic about that. I think in addition to women, I'm really focused on BIPOC leaders and storytellers and making sure that the barriers that um, perhaps white women faced along the way, we can learn from them, we can lean into them, and we can just pay attention to, you know, women being at the table, but all women, right, all women. And that's something um, that I'm really thinking deeply about is just learning from challenges that I've had and making sure that I'm always paying attention. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's been so much progress and there's still so much further to go. <laughs> so much. Um, there will always be that, right? Like, I think this is also just um, now that I'm multiple years in, I feel like if I had seen what we were able to accomplish, I'd be so proud. And then now I just see all the more that we can do. We're just showing ourselves how much more equitable we can be. And that's how I want to lead. And I know that's how you do lead. So it's that's great for me to have a role model like that as well with your track record. Well, that's so nice of you to say. Um, all right. So Frontline's first documentary in 1983 was an unauthorized history of the NFL. And your latest film, which just premiered last week, is The Age of Easy Money, a timely look at the Federal Reserve. And that turned out to be incredibly timely. Very timely. So Frontline's, yeah. So Frontline's topics have ranged from genocide in Rwanda to the power of big oil to COVID-19. And we've got a great question on that from Gloria in Wellesley. And she says, how do you make the decision of what story to cover? I mean, what factors are influential in deciding, yes, I'm going to do this or no, I'm not going to do that? Because there's, as we know, a zillion good stories out there. So how do you decide? Everyone asked me that question. I think it's one of the, the most interesting questions to answer um, thoughtfully. So I would say you see Frontline making decisions to tell stories when we have something special to say that we think needs to be said. In other words, we're not competing with the news, but we're thinking thoughtfully about do we have something that's original, investigative journalism by its nature is saying, how can we move the story further? How can we ask tougher questions? How can we understand understand a problem that you may be seeing in the world right now, right? Like inflation. So we we looked at, okay, how did that all happen? And who's it, who's in charge, right? So we decided to focus Age of Easy Money on the Federal Reserve. That was a really serious decision we made two years ago to say, people really don't understand the Fed. So as a series with a public mission purpose, we need to tell stories that actually shows the public what they need to know that they might not quite understand and connect the dots. So that's why you don't see us running after every single news story. We may feel like we don't have anything very special or original to share, and then we'll wait. So sometimes for Frontline, we move fast. There are stories that we've told within a number of weeks. I'll give you a great example is the Ebola crisis in West Africa. We had very special footage out of West Africa. I looked at it. I made a decision that there was no way we could hold on to this. And we literally, a word we like to use in our business is we crashed it onto the air, meaning we worked really fast within two weeks we had a broadcast. The same thing was true for the Mueller report. We had some very special information I felt the public needed to know. And so we rushed that onto the air. And of course, you've seen us do that 
with Ukraine over and over again. We're putting, reporting out in a more iterative fashion because we feel like the public needs to know. So sometimes our films can take upwards of two or three years to make because we're spending the time to get it right and to have it be something that we think is going to be meaningful and impactful for our audience. Well, in this, uh, the latest film on, on, you know, the Federal Reserve, you did start that a while ago. And then, of course, we had all of the meltdown of, of the banks just in the last few weeks. And what did you do? Well, we have it. We actually have this very interesting method that I've been putting into practice more in the last number of years, which is making sure that Frontline is current to the moment that we publish. So it could have been in the past where you wouldn't feel like it was really on the news, but actually my background is news and I love current affairs. So what I like to do is to have the story that helps you understand what's happening today. So that means we build documentaries that have an infrastructure, a narrative infrastructure that goes back in time. But if something happens very close to the moment we're publishing, we're able to move very quickly to essentially do the, the pertinent interviews to have it very much in the current day. So when you're watching it, it's a relevant experience of what you're experiencing today, not two years ago when we started. So actually with the SVB moment, you know, Susan and I were actually in a meeting, you know, we're meeting and I noticed like out, and it's a virtual meeting, but I noticed outside my, my office door, people are pacing outside of my door and I'm like, what are they doing? And they're trying to get my, my attention. And it's the Friday before air. Okay. So that's really giving us three days to update our film. And so they were pretty nervous. They're like, Hey, and I'm like, I'm in a meeting with Susan Goldberg, please. And so essentially it came out and SVB had just crashed, which we then, um, decided that we needed to watch to see what the fed would do over the weekend. Right. The fed made a move on Sunday you saw them essentially bail out SVB. And so we did new interviews on Monday morning. And that's why Age of Easy Money feels like it's of the moment because it actually is. But you have the narrative framework to give you the whole story of what you're seeing. And that's really our secret sauce. Yep, that's the best place to be in something topical, relevant that people are talking about, but the big, but the big picture. So, and the next time we're in a meeting, something really important happens, tell them to knock on the door. All right. <laughs> So oh, I, love will. I learned my lesson. You would have appreciated <laughs> that too, of all people. I know I would have been really excited. All right. So I, I love that Frontline has this incredible dedication to the transparency of its sources because transparency builds trust and trust is a real issue in our business. So Rainey, you were groundbreaking in that regard with the launch of the Transparency Project. Can you tell us more about how you do that and why you think it's important? Yeah, I mean, actually, the Transparency Project comes out of a long tradition at Frontline, where Frontline historically would publish transcripts from your interviews and text. And so the leap that I made in 2000, and I think it was in, in the Putin era, just as he was coming on as a major force, was to say um, there was such a lack of trust in journalism at that time, right, that what could Frontline do to build trust with our audience? And so um, a text, you know, transcript online is really not even searchable. And in the digital landscape, it's really important to have searchable video, actually. It turns out video is what people want to really see. So we launched a transparency project, which is a pretty radical idea for journalism because we're essentially sharing our outtakes with the public. And we're saying, and we worked with Duke to actually create something that is searchable video, which sounds a little bit wonky, but it's critical. It means that you could be watching our documentary, but you can go into the actual interview and search it yourself, right? To see like, were we fair in our editing? Did we make good choices? What was the context of the conversation? And we talked to very influential people. So what happened is remarkable. We did not do this as an audience um, driver. We did this as a trust builder. But what happened is now that we have these interviews available for the public, millions of people watch them. They are as successful in some cases as our actual documentaries. People search them, people share them, and people actually comment on them. It's just remarkable to see what's happened. What it also does, and I'll just say this as an editor, is, you know, I'm the editor of the show. So what that means is I have to make sure everything that we put in our films is true, that we didn't edit anything out of context. So it also holds us to account 
It holds our editors to account in the edit rooms. It holds our filmmakers to account because their actual conversations are in public now. And so it's been a number of years and it's just been, it's been amazing. Thank you for mentioning it. Well, you know, we're seeing a lot in journalism, a lot more original documentation being posted next to stories, right? So yes. the simplest example is if there's a Supreme Court decision, now people will also not just write about that story, but post the entire decision. Right. And so those who want can can read the entire thing. But do you get people who, after they watch some of these interviews, push back and say, well, why wasn't that included or not? Yeah, not, we haven't actually, what we have had happen, which I think is very interesting is other journalists have taken our journalism and written about it. And we're like, oh, we didn't see that as a story. So it's like the conversation, because we're thinking of our documentary, print journalists are using them now as sources, right? So, which they can do, it's public purpose it's out there for everyone. So that's been a little bit, um, I don't know what the right word is other than humbling, where you see somebody else writing about your own work and you're thinking, why didn't we think of that as actually a news moment? You know, it's like, oh goodness, like, you know, we're really our documentarian. So that has been something we've been thinking about more is there are stories within those stories that yeah. we need to own and tell. So we've almost like been scooped by ourselves, you know, and that's just well, an interesting concept, you know, it could be worse. Well, it could be worse. I mean, it is it is always interesting to see, you know, like what sidebars almost come out of that come out of that big story. But I would also just say, hey, as long as they credit us, all, yeah, all they good. Do. Yeah, it's all so, good. Right? Yeah. And no one I do. The other challenge I've seen is like I've been really talking about this as an idea for journalism to build trust for years. And so far, other news organizations aren't doing it. In fact, other editors are like, are you nuts to do that? To let all of your outtakes out there? That's really, you know, not, I mean, you're an editor too. It's like, it is a big act of faith in your journalists to be ethical along the way at all steps, but I think it's worth it. So I hope somebody else will actually start to do this too. Well, I hope they will too, because I do agree that it builds credibility because if we collectively don't have credibility, I don't think we really have much to tell anybody. It's really what we have, right? Yep. So a couple of times you have mentioned the issue of, you know, sort of broadening, broadening the base of, of who is being able to tell these stories. Um, and that is an incredibly important way to build trust too, right? Have an inclusive group of filmmakers, but investigative journalists, journalism out of all different kinds of journalism has been really traditionally one of the least diverse. So how are you trying to tackle that? Well, I think it started with my own earnest belief in that. Okay, so I think it starts with believing that that's better for your journalism and better for simply survival and thriving, right? Like those those elements, right? I didn't believe that Frontline could continue being predominantly male and white and be a thriving news organization. And my job is to make sure Frontline is that. That's literally my job in a nutshell. So for me, it's a really earnest belief that we need to have every every single person at the table. We need to think through carefully who they are and whose voices are being amplified and centered. And so I actually started with my senior team. I started with looking at who is running frontline and making editorial decisions across the board. And I hired new people. So that was probably the first act was to make sure that I had my own house in order before I started to bring filmmakers in of color who I knew were going to have problems if they didn't have a diverse leadership team, right? So both women and BIPOC leaders at the senior table were, was one of the most important first acts I did. I did that within the first couple of years of running Frontline. And that was a profound change. Story development changed, story choice changed, who we hired changed, right? And so that led from the top, right? And I, I love my senior team is for that reason. And I feature them often because I believe in them. And I believe we've been doing a, a really good job. Next, I had to understand our film industry barriers. The film industry in general has really attracted people who either have personal financing themselves, I found out, right? So you're independently wealthy, so you can actually go from job to job and not have stability. Um, and so it's actually been a huge barrier as a financial one. So the next thing I did, and I've done this incredibly um, intentionally, is open up budgets from our core budget for new filmmakers. 
and new storytellers. And that was difficult for some people who had worked for Frontline for a long time. Um, I was careful and thoughtful and we worked through how we could do that together. But essentially I made space financially and it's not rocket science. You pay people well, you have an equitable mindset and then people come to work for you. And, and those people have now worked for us for years now, which is why we have a diverse producing pool. Additional to that though, is the question that you have about investigative journalism um, is predominantly white and male for the most part. So we worked hard at building fellowship programs at the entry level and also the mid-career level. That was really key, right? First, it was like the entry level is important so you can mentor. But secondly, what about all the mid-career journalists out there who have not had the support from Frontline? And I really worked hard on that and have done fundraising. And we've, we've been very successful in part because I do have a lot of support from public media. GBH is a big supporter of our work in this area, as is PBS and Paula Kerger. You know, they've been, you all have been really supportive of these efforts and helped me fundraise. So it sounds like you think this is one of your, the great successes that, that you've had. Um, do you, do you think that having this broader base of storytellers, having a much more diverse group of storytellers, are they making sure that like experts in the stories, people that they are going to, to be, you know, important sources for stories? Is that also a more diverse group? A hundred percent. That was one of the more amazing things. It's like, you, you can't just put a bandaid over these different issues that you have of having all white experts, right? Once you hire people of color in those positions and the senior leadership team, and even myself too, it's like we all sort of started again with who are our expert pool. That is not a hard thing to do. It just takes will and intention. It's not hard at all. It's like they're all waiting to talk to us. And it was it was like awesome, actually. And we actually did um, track our experts. So we've been really intentional on the data side. Um, for years now, we've tracked our data on the producing pool, the makeup of our team, and who appears on camera as experts. And having that accountability where we could then talk to our producers who weren't diversifying their experts, having data to be able to activate it, to have real conversations about like the why not was great, you know? So I have to say like all of our producers are really now who currently work for Frontline, I should say, are totally beyond on board, you know, now they're just, it's just been surprisingly easy. I don't want to say easy, like it doesn't take intention. I just mean it was the right thing to do. So everything started to fall into place. It does take intention, but I think too often in journalism, people are just sort of going back to the usual suspects, right? The same sources yes. over and over because yes. they might be really good, but there's yeah. so many more people out there. Well, that wasn't interesting to me and never has been. So like, I'm a person who loves living in the world at large, right? Right after college and after college lived in the world. And I think a lot of people who work for Frontline now, that just isn't interesting to us. We want new voices and we want to amplify new people on camera as well as our correspondents too. So that's why you've seen so much change is because we all want that. Exactly. All right. Well, I want to thank our audience for a minute for submitting so many great questions before this event, and we're going to get to more of them in just a minute. But first, I want to introduce my colleague, Sandy Chin. Welcome, Sandy. Thank you, Susan. And thank you to you at home for spending some time with us and to today's special guest, Rainey Arison Rath, as she talks about her experience as the editor-in-chief and executive producer of GBH's Frontline. And for decades, GBH has told stories that matter, connected facts and revealed the truths you need, embraced progress toward a more connected world, and illuminated the spirit of this great region. GBH is always here for you, energized every single day. And now we ask you to commit to GBH with an important donation of support. Today, when you donate $7.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, or $90 all at once, you will receive Frontline's Black Tote Bag as a thank you gift. And giving is so easy. Just go to gbh.org slash support events to make your donation. Every dollar donors give helps us provide more free programs and events to the community. Simply click on the support link in the chat tab now or text GBH to 800 204 
3811 to make your donation. Or go ahead and scan the QR code here on your screen. And we say this often, but only because it's the single most important fact about GBH. Everything you count on here from GBH, the trusted news, in-depth investigations, conversations, podcasts, counts in turn on your support. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you. And now back to part two of today's event, moderated by GBH's president and CEO, Susan Goldberg. Thank you, Sandy. And thanks, Rainey. I'm so excited to finish our conversation. Part two is coming right up. So Gail from Northampton is asking, how do you gain access to accurate information, information that you really think is right, and then how do you validate it? And I, that's such a huge issue, right? Figuring out the wheat from the chaff of information. Yeah, I mean, I love that question more than pretty much any question about journalism because it gets at the essence of literally what we do day in and day out. So I think I want to start with the fact that most of us are trained journalists, so we have the skill set to essentially be ferreting out truth. But we also have this really amazing process at Frontline of vetting everything that you see. We don't only just vet what people tell us. We make sure anything that they say is true. So even if it's a terrific person that you know has you know, a great status, right? we check everything that they say, every assertion that they make. If we can't back up their assertions, we do not include it. It's as simple as that. And everything that we do at Frontline um, in terms of what you're seeing visually is also fact-checked. We have a team of people who spend hours and hours every day. That's literally their jobs looking at what they what you're seeing, what you're looking at. So if we say it's 2008 and the financial crisis, it's actually 2008. That's very unusual for documentary films. Usually documentary films in the world at large, like on Netflix or HBO, they don't have that level of fact checking. But what our promise is that we're a journalism series, right? We're all journalists through and through. So we have to check everything that you see. Um, in terms of things like anonymous sources um, and anon anonymous content in general, you don't see a lot of that on Frontline for a reason. So unless we can really vet it, um, by a couple of other sources that we really know it's true, then you'll see us include it. But otherwise, what you're seeing is what you get. And that makes us sometimes not as forward as sometimes with investigative journalism, you'll see them make these huge claims, right? At Frontline, if we have a huge claim, we will share it. But if it's not 100% vetted, you'll see us actually be real with what we know. And we don't go beyond what we know. Um, and it's 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 one of the joys of my life is working with the editors at Frontline who are you know literally tirelessly um, kicking the tires and everything that we share. So there's a related question from Beth in Fairport, New York, who is really asking, well, how can a citizen who might not have a team of fact checkers behind him or her, you know, how can they really work on their own media literacy? Are there tips or tricks or things that people should work for as they try to sort out, you know, what's real and what's not real, because it's getting harder and harder to tell sometimes. It is so hard right now with dissonance information just really running rampant. I have two teenagers, and so trust me, in our home, um, we talk a lot about media literacy and sourcing. The one thing that I talk a lot about is making sure that when you're watching something on social media, you understand the genesis of that clip. A lot of times things are taken out of context, and a lot of times even the underlying sourcing isn't there. If that's the case, that's not trustworthy information. I've had my extremely intelligent 16-year-old boy tell me facts that he believes are real. So then I go into the social media app with him and I look at them with him and I show him how this is just somebody spouting off facts, but it's not based in journalistic integrity. And that's been really eye-opening for him. And so that's what I do is I litigate that with my own family to make sure that what we see and we believe is based in facts and it's hard. And so a lot of times what I do as a media consumer is I'm just literally going to my trusted media sources. I make sure I have a diverse source pool. So I go to the Wall Street Journal. I really try my hardest to have a variety of opinions coming at me. And at the end of the day, you're you're in a digital soup right now. So you just have to watch what are the ingredients, right? And you can choose your ingredients, actually, if you're intentional about it, but it, it takes intention. Well, so you're 
So some of your advice then is go to trusted brands, get out of your own bubble. Yeah. And my advice is always, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Absolutely. Yeah. And also be aware right now. And I think Susan, you're right. Be aware that people can edit things to have them look very truthful. But if they aren't going through vetted journalistic editors' hands, that could be anything. So for us at Frontline, we should say that a lot of times we're using things that are coming from the field. If it's not one of our journalists, we're actually, we actually have to triple source the veracity of that visual piece of something. You have to make sure that that's real. And that's really hard. So a lot of times we don't use very exciting looking footage because we can't, we can't verify that it's true. Yep. That is, that is so true. And, you know, you just brought up your kids and I, I wanted to follow up a little bit. You know, I've always thought good editors get great story ideas from everywhere, you know, from our, from, from readers and viewers, from our, from our colleagues and also from our families. Do you ever get story ideas from your kids? I'll tell you my kids. Yes. However, I'll tell you what they've really done. So what my daughter, I'll just share one little story with you because I think it's emblematic of my leadership in general, but a lot of people my age will say this too. My daughter was two when she had her first experience with media, which was an iPad, Susan. She didn't watch television first. She had an iPad and she was really natively so savvy. It was a first generation iPad. Her little hands were like incredible. It was like watching somebody experience media like I had never seen and she'd never seen the TV set. Her next media experience was television. And so that was six months later. And she was looking at the TV set and she was trying to touch it, the screen. And she was like, what's wrong with this media? <laughs> and she's stamping her feet because she's two and a half, right? And in that moment, she like defied my understanding of, of television and linear storytelling to say, we need to, as journalists, accept the fact that people are now in an interactive environment experiencing their media in ways that I had to kind of just open my mind. And you've seen us do a lot of work in that area because I firmly believe younger people experience media differently. I firmly want Frontline to be in their consideration set. So how do we reach them too? And so my daughter kind of changed my life and defied my career it was a great moment. Um, so your kids teach you many things. And, and my son teaches me things too. Like, for example, the importance of YouTube. If he hadn't been literally getting my attention to the real importance of that platform to people his age, I don't think I would have pushed as strongly as I did with PBS. And this is before you, but you know the legacy of this to say that Frontline needs to be on platforms where people are, as opposed to expecting that younger people were going to come to us um, on television. So again, like they've taught me a lot, mostly in that realm. Well, no, it, those are great examples of, you know, we always talk about re meeting our audiences where they are. Yes. And, and this couldn't be a better example of that. You know, let's get back to the sort of some of the storytelling itself. You know, fairness is another really key aspect in building trust. And Diane from Clinton, Connecticut asks, what is your overarching guiding principle for fair coverage and in investigations? And I love that. I'm so glad you asked, Diane. Yeah, thank you, Diane. That's another favorite. You're all asking such great questions. Thank you. Um, for me, fairness is everything. So we, um, we have a sort of theory at Frontline, and I say it pretty much daily, if not multiple times a day, which is essentially we're reporting against our assumptions. So as an investigative journalist, you are out there investigating a single idea, an idea, but you have to do it with an open mind. So even if you think you have something settled, you always have to keep an open mind. I'll give you a great example. With our series, um, The Power of Big Oil, we were really reporting on the company Exxon as one of the major companies that we were investigating. And we kept going back to Exxon. We kept asking them for their opinion. We kept saying, this is what we found out. What do you have to say about that? Sometimes companies will drop on you three or 400 pages of material for you to wade through. And trust me, we wade through every single word. We want to make sure 
did we get it right or our assumptions right? Do they actually have a point of view we need to include? And so until the moment of publishing, we're open to new information. We're open to literally anyone in the room asking us a question. There have been people on my staff at junior levels who have asked questions in a room because that's our environment and culture. And they've been right to ask it. And we've gone back and checked things. And sure enough, they've been right to ask that question. So we have a lot of people at the table making sure we're being fair. And I think one of the more important things to me is, um, and it's worth sharing with you all, that I care deeply about us being nonpartisan. It's I very, it's, it's like in my bones. I care so deeply and so does everybody at Frontline. And I think one of the things that I'm really proud of is that our audience is bipartisan. When you look at our broadcast and streaming audience, they're really 30% self, they, they are saying to us in these surveys that they're Democratic, they're Republican, and they're independent. It's almost 30, 30, 30. So we have the audience that says that, you know what, we can experience across a partisan spectrum, the same media, the same facts, the same journalism. Well, and I think it's all about, as you said, approaching any story with, um, with an open mind and a willingness to change your mind once you learn more facts about, you know, you might start like, I think the theory of this story is this, but it really might turn out to be something else. Yeah, I'm surprised daily with what we learn, the deeper we get, the more nuanced reporting we do at how the story has changed and how I change, you know, and I think that's um, being curious actually is our our collective secret sauce is actually being curious and not being a polemicist. Well, I was going to ask you about that. So what is the most important characteristic if you want to be a great journalist? Is it curiosity, do you think? I think that's one of them. I am always like reticent to say one thing because you can be curious and then not follow through. But I think um, curiosity and tenacity are probably the two most important elements that I see being successful in my line of work because you can be curious, but if you're not tenacious to go after those curiosities and go deeper and deeper, you, you can stop at a sort of curious wide-eyed moment. It, it is an amazing world out there, but you've got to get down to business and figure out how, how you're going to then tell the story as a documentary. That, that just takes a lot of tenacity, resiliency. Um, I think in the Trump era, when a lot of journalists were really feeling vulnerable and worried, and um, there was a lot of violence against journalists, I think having resiliency to believe that like what we do is so important is also key right now in this era of journalism. Oh, I so agree with you. I want to talk for a minute about Frontline's work in local communities and with local journalism. You know, this is something that we've talked a lot about because... Um, you know, local journalism in a lot of parts of the country is really in trouble. I think since 2000, 200 daily newspapers have gone out of business and thousands of weeklies have as well. But I know you've been trying to work really hard to do something to, you know, make sure there aren't news deserts and to really pump up local news. Can you tell people a little bit about, about yeah. that? I care deeply about that. I actually come from rural America. I grew up in rural America. And so I'm a big believer that every single story is local, right? If you think about every story we tell, it has a local genesis. My career alone, you know, I remember the days at ABC News where essentially story developers were ripping the stories out of local journalism. And that always shook me to think that even the local journalists weren't getting the credit, right? Like they were just telling their stories, but what were they doing to help local journalism? And it was actually because I feel like for Frontline, you know, we're a big national series, but we need to be part of a solution. We're not gonna be the solution, but I couldn't just stand by as local journalism was being literally gutted in my tenure, right over the last seven years. Um, and so what happened is we were able to fundraise a grant that supports five local newsrooms. And then what we do in, in most cases is we make documentaries about that local journalism, centering the local journalists, right? Putting the local journalists on camera, having them tell the stories out of places like Minneapolis, Utah, Texas. We have a story right now in North Carolina that's really alarming, um, as well as Rhode Island. So we're putting essentially funding into these newsrooms. And this is all for investigative journalism, which as you know, is one of the first things that gets cut because it is expensive. It, it takes a lot of expertise. And it's also like, 
you know, you and I've talked about this, you know, corruption doesn't just show its face, right? So when investigative journalism disappears in local communities, it's hard to see the impact because they're not ferreting out corruption and local accountability work, right? It's just not there. So things are going along, but actually when journalists are there holding, you know, governments and corporations and people to account, it's a, it's, you know, such a healthier healthier way to to be in our democracy right now without it i'm i'm fearful you know it's one of the big mysteries to me though i know that the business model for local journalism really has been challenged since 1995 really the advent of the internet and how that that really did change business models and everybody talks about local journalism is so important and yet and yet we've seen all of these papers go out of business all of you know um and including including weeklies so is it that is it that you think they were telling stories where the readers weren't telling trying to reach people on the wrong platforms or was it the stories they're telling so I, I definitely think it's a combination of both. I really look closely at this. I think most of all, it's that the ad model with Craigslist and what happened with the internet really fell apart and there wasn't a plan B. And one thing I think that we're doing at Frontline and GBH is like we're creating plan Bs, right, for our work so that we have sustainability models in place so that we survive and thrive. And I feel the newspaper industry didn't do that as much. And that's not really their fault. It's just that that's what happened. The disruption was real and there wasn't something to come in to replace it financially. But I do think then choices were made. I mean, I'm biased. This is where I'm actually not um, nonpartisan. I feel like choices were made not to continue the accountability work that would have kept them more valid and, and vital to local communities. Like for example, the nonprofits that are coming up now in place of some of these newspapers are all focused on investigative journalism because that's the value add, right? You can figure out from the internet where the meeting is gonna be held for such and such, but the local investigative journalism is what is really, I think somebody might pay for or subscribe to and support right? Because they can see it's holding our community to account. And we really need to make sure that we do that in our democracy, right? For our democracy to be a healthy place. Well, and it's all about providing value that people can't get just from absolutely anywhere else, because information exactly. is out there in a big way. So what do we, you know, right. we collectively provide as value? And this is, this is actually bringing me to some of your work as an innovator. You know, you had mentioned in YouTube and, um, you know, you've been streaming documentaries uh, for way before, way before Netflix. You know, YouTube didn't even exist until until 2005, and you started streaming documentaries um, in 1995. Um, what do you think? You know, what do you think is next? So I know Frontline has got what two million followers on YouTube. What yeah, are we... the next big platforms that you want to tackle? So that's a great question. I think the question, the way that I answer that instead of platforms, because I think we're going to explore that together, I hope, you know, as a, as a company, as a foundation, as like, where should we be going? I think we definitely can see growth on YouTube that is going to be astronomical in the next number of years continuing. And I think the reason for that is because it's very hard to find high quality journalism and documentaries in front of a paywall. Our documentary films are free, right? For people to watch and to explore. And so my guess is that we become increasingly important to people who can't afford to pay for Netflix, for Amazon, for others that you have to pay for, right? You're seeing the same thing with the newspaper model where you have to subscribe, right? In order to get that content. So that's where their growth area is for younger people. Are people really subscribing? And so for us is looking at, that's our actual benefit to the public. That's why we're a public media, is our investigative journalism is out there for people to explore. And my hope is that, I'm really hopeful is that we continue to push onto YouTube, but we also really attend to 
our own streaming platforms that we own and operate, right? And can figure out membership models around the work that we own and operate because being reliant on commercial platforms for your work, it, you don't wanna only do that. You wanna always have a public media mindset with the work that we produce. And I think that's what we're, that's some exciting ground I hope we cover together. I do too. You know, uh, YouTube is amazing. And I know we've got a, a lot of uh, full length documentaries there. You know, just yesterday, the head of TikTok was testifying before yes. Congress, and we know there has been, you know, enormous growth in that platform, especially among younger people. Yes. Uh, I think it's the fastest growing platform. Um, I don't know if what will happen with TikTok, because there was a lot of there was a lot of anger at that at that meeting um, from you know from members of Congress. But do you think that there's a way to tell investigative or journalism? in a much shorter format. I don't know if it would be a TikTok format, but tell yeah. me about that. No, I do. And we are doing um, YouTube shorts right now, which will be translatable onto to TikTok. I absolutely do. I think there's a way to do very quick, very short, potent investigative journalism. And I want to do that, right? Because I want us, again, with the same mindset towards local journalism, I want Frontline to be part of a solution here. I want, especially when I look at my kids' content, I want us in that digital mix so that they will stumble across Frontline, right? They will come across us and say like, oh, that's actually vetted and real when they look at the underlying sources, right? So I think we do need to be in that game. We're also, as you know, launching a youth pilot for Frontline, which is shorter form documentaries. So younger people love documentaries, in fact, on YouTube, our top search term is documentary. So people are looking for documentaries and finding Frontline, right? That's how they find us, which is fascinating, right? So if you take that to the short form, um, I really want to start, and we, we do have funding for a pilot, um, really creating content for younger people. And that will um, include thinking carefully about what content we are creating for them, right? What are the visual images that we're sharing with them? Um, just with, with being careful about younger people and their teens even, what kind of images should they be seeing? And how can we break down some of these really complex ideas? And teenagers are so sophisticated and we will not be calling it a younger watch edition, but the mindset will be towards shorter, um, faster, and also younger storytellers as well. Well, and you also mentioned the concept of being part of the solution, which I sometimes think is a problem in our, our journalism, um, that it's so, you know, downbeat, can be so negative, only looking at Absolutely. the problems. And, and heaven knows there's a lot of problems that we have to look at and we have to be fact-based. But how do we also do a better job talking about some solutions so people don't feel so terrible, like they're almost afraid to watch? Right. They're like, oh my God, I can't watch that. I, okay, so my ethos on this is, okay, and again, this is where my bias shines straight through because it's my whole career, but I do believe that investigative journalism is a precursor to solutions. And let me explain what I mean. If you don't know what the problems are that you can investigate and actually shed real light on them, how do you come up with a real solution? So Frontline generally is saying like, hey, this is this is why this doesn't work, but here's what could work. So if you watch our films closely, we're always looking at other alternates in those films to show like if we did it this way, you know, um, things would work better. But I do think like ferreting out what's not working is the first step to a solution and not ignoring um, corruption, essentially. <laughs> Oh no, we sure we sure can't ignore corruption. That that is for sure. So, Rainy, you know, you I think are such an inspiration to the next generation of journalists. Mm -hmm. And Deborah from Hanover, Maryland, is asking if I'm interested in a communications career, what is the best major to choose as an undergraduate? Oh, that's a great question. I have a lot of people ask me that. First of all, I say for people who want to be journalists, just make sure you pressure test that to make sure you really want to be a journalist, right? Wait, explain what you mean by that. What does that mean? When you're young, like I was too, like I could have been a diplomat, right? But I really pressure tested that to make sure, okay, would that be a good fit for me? And, and I really tried it on for sides. I took the government classes. I had a very wide ranging undergraduate degree for that reason. 
my belief is when you're in your undergraduate years, it's awesome to study things that actually intellectually interest you because that will make you the best journalist. Like if you want to be, um, I was a history major and a South Asian studies major, and I actually lived in India for a whole year in my undergraduate degree, right, years. And that was the best thing I could have ever done to prepare me for a career of journalism, was to be curious about the world and to study things across a wide swath of intellectual, uh, my own intellectual curiosities, because that will help you later when you are a journalist know more things. So that is just like my ethos about communications degrees is not that they're, they're bad, they're great too, but to also take classes that you're really intellectually interested in, even if they seem like they're not in your major, like take an economics course. I'm really glad I did that because guess what? I had to just oversee a major documentary on our economy. If I didn't understand some of those components, I wouldn't have been as good a boss. So I really do believe in collecting and learning as many different types of things as you can along the way. You know, and this is sort of a subset of the bigger question, which is, is journalism even a good career to go into anymore? I mean, I have not so much younger people ask me that, but their parents ask me that, <laughs> um, you know, should I let my kid be a journalist? Because we hear a lot about problems of journalism, right? The erosion of trust, sometimes the danger really that journalists can find themselves in, even not, not in a war zone, which has always been true, but even just covering a political rally. Um, the, you know, the news deserts that we're seeing. So is this, is this a good career? Um, I think absolutely, yes, it is. As long as you really want to um, be extremely resilient in your career. So I think if you're looking for an easy career, maybe not, but actually journalism is thriving right now. You just have to look in the right places. You have to think about nonprofit journalism. You have to think out of the box a little bit about what you're doing. But what I've been really encouraged by is because I do have a 16 year old, how many young people want to be journalists right now? It's amazing. They see it as one of the only places where they can have impact, right? They see a troubled world. So they're wondering, what can we do to your point about solutions? What can we do to have an impact in the world? And they're really seeing younger people, like so many people applying to journalism school right now for that reason, because they see it as one way to hold the troubled world to account is to gain the skills to be a serious skilled journalist. And I'm all for that, as long as you're thinking hard about that career. Oh, I think it's a, a fantastic career too. I mean, what better way to make a difference, to make a difference in the world? Hmm. All right, the last thing I wanna ask you really is about this notion of objectivity. So we're talking about a lot of younger people and whether they wanna become journalists. I also hear a lot of younger people and some older um, saying that there's no such thing as objectivity. And um, what do you think about that? No, I don't like the word objectivity because I think it gets us away from just practicing serious journalism. I don't really believe an objectivity like a 50-50. That's never been my, um, that's never been what I believe in. I do believe in fairness. So what I believe in is journalism that doesn't have an agenda going in. I don't want agenda journalism. I do want to have a difference between advocacy and journalism, but that doesn't mean that Frontline doesn't have a point of view when we have reported it. I believe in reported journalism. So if you earn it, right, if you have taken on a company that you're reporting on and you have findings, you could share those findings as long as you include some of what the company believes, it's not, as long as they're not lying and you're fair. But so I really believe in fairness. Um, and that's where I focus our work on is being fair, tough on the facts, tough on all sides and, you know, being independent. I really do believe that we need to remain independent. And that's something that, um, you know, I hope you do. I, I do think you agree with too, is, is remaining independent and having our own space as journalists. Remaining independent, fair-minded, tough, and credible uh, to <laughs> audiences is, I think, I agree with you 100%, the way forward, whatever is the right single word for that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, Rainy. This has been the most delightful time talking with you. We have to do it more often, maybe I down in your office or up <laughs> in my office next time. 
Uh, I want to just let our audience know that Frontline airs on Tuesday evenings on GBH2 and the PBS app and is available on the Frontline YouTube channel. So you can visit Frontline PBS on social media and online at frontline.wgbh.org slash frontline. That's a mouthful, but please join us there. And Rainy, thank you again so much. Thank you, Susan. It was wonderful. Thanks again.